fourth in our Material Histories seminar series for 2023. Today we'll be discussing early toilets. I'm Lorinda Kramer from the Australian Catholic University and I'm delighted that you've been able to join us. Let me begin by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you from the unceded land of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people of the Kulin Nation. I thank them for their care of culture and of country and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, but also acknowledge any First Nations people who may be joining us today from elsewhere. Material Histories is a seminar series offered jointly by the Old Treasury Building and the Australian Catholic University. In each discussion, we explore an aspect of material history through an object or a series of objects. The seminars are open to anyone interested in material history, and we hope to cast the subject net widely in terms of both time and place. So if you're interested in contributing, please get in touch. We'll pop some email addresses on the screen at the end of the seminar. So just a few words about the structure of the seminar before I hand over to our chair today. I'm sure you're all well used to dis digital seminars by now, but just to confirm, this is a webinar format, so you will see and hear the speakers only. If you have any difficulties, please use the chat button at the bottom of your screens, and Katie, behind the scenes, will do her very best to help you out. And if you have a question, we really hope you will, please use the Q&A button. And of course, please keep those questions and comments courteous. And finally, a reminder that the webinar will be recorded. So it's now my great pleasure to introduce my colleague, Sally Fisher, who will chair the discussion today. Dr. Sally Fisher is a research associate in the Gender and Women's History Research Centre in the Institute for Humanities and Social Sciences at ACU. She's a specialist interest in gender and culture in the late medieval and early modern period, plus an interest in material histories across diverse places and times. So Sally, over to you. Thank you, Lorinda. I'd like to join Lorinda in welcoming you today to our material history seminar on early toilets. I'm joining you from the unceded lands of the Zsa Rung people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I'm excited to be chairing this seminar because I'm fascinated to hear how these papers will consider connections between status and power in 19th century Melbourne through waste management and specifically by examining the materiality of the toilet bowl and cesspits. We're very pleased to have Dr. Sarah Hayes and Margaret Anderson with us to share their fascinating material histories. It's my pleasure to first introduce Dr. Sarah Hayes. Sarah is an archaeologist and senior research fellow at the Alfred Deakin Institute, Deakin University. Her work focuses on the role consumption plays in quality of life and social mobility and associated waste behaviour. She is an Australian Research Council Discovery Early Career Researcher Award recipient and Honorary Associate at Museums Victoria. Sarah's presentation is titled Toileting Early Melbourne, the Political Landscape and Lived Reality of Chamber Pots, Cesspits and Night Pan. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sally, for that uh, wonderful introduction. And um, I'm very happy to be here and talking uh, about about toilets, which is, you know, always great fun. <laughs> so Melbourne was very slow to introduce sewerage infrastructure. Uh, Hamburg built sewers in the 1840s and New York in the 1850s, uh, London in the 1860s, but Melbourne didn't even start until the 1890s. Um, so this meant that chamber pots and cesspits were the reality of toileting for most people in Melbourne for most of the 19th century. Um, for some, this wasn't too bad, not, not a huge problem. Take, for example, John Thomas Smith, who was mayor of Melbourne at the height of the gold rush. He uh, was elected in 1851, same year that gold was found. Um, and his chamber pot 
that you can see here, was found by archaeologists at 300 Queen Street. So, and this, was, this excavation was back in the 1980s, uh, just incidentally. Um, so Mayor Smith was uh, born in Sydney and he was actually the son of a convict. Um, and he, so he, he had a pretty remarkable life and pretty rapid rise to go from being a convict son to being mayor of Melbourne. Um, and he built this beautiful Georgian manor for himself. And I think he fancied himself as an important man in Melbourne. And this was his chamber pot, <laughs> uh, which I think reflects a lot of things about him. And uh, I won't, I, I won't, go into it in great detail, but it is certainly a grand and attractive uh, chamber pot by the standards um, of the day. There were plenty of cheap, humble ones, but this this is pretty nice. Um, so, and then Maggie's going to be talking to you uh, about the governor's spectacular toilet as well, which is far better than this chamber pot. Um, but this lies in stark contrast, contrast to what was going on elsewhere in Melbourne. So this uh, area that you can see here is Little Lawn, which was an inner urban working class residential and business district. Uh, there were butchers, bootmakers, pawn shops, brothels, uh, lots of labourers lived in the area and people like to talk about the criminals in the area as well. Um, so this is really just around the corner from Parliament and Old Treasury, a stone's throw from Melbourne's seat of power. Um, the archaeology that has been done here over the years uh, has, shows a really different, in, different toileting reality for Melbourne's less privileged citizens. So since 1988, Little Lawn has uh, been the subject of a number of archaeological excavations uh, because of all the Commonwealth block developments that happened there. Um, and yeah, there's, so there's extensive, it's one of the largest collections of archaeological artefacts in the world. Um, so it's a great, amazing resource. And many of the best artefacts from this site uh, were recovered from um, disused cesspits, so artefacts that have been thrown into cesspits. And these are like fantastic little time capsules for archaeologists. This is um, this poor person is excavating a cesspit, but in reality, it's an archaeologist's happy place, so that's all okay. Um, Many of, uh, oh, sorry, in the process of dating and contextualising the rubbish discarded into cesspits, historian Barbara Minchinton um, and I, and, and this paper is based on the work that we've done together, um, went down a bit of a rabbit hole of research into cesspits, as Little, little On also provides some of the best physical evidence for the key in, impacts of early toileting on poorer people living in Melbourne. In Little On and Melbourne generally from the 1840s to the 1870s, most of the toilets were cesspits. Basically, these are long drop toilets, a hole in the ground with planks of wood or toilet or a toilet seat above, uh, not like a nice, you know, modern one, just like a hole in a piece of wood. Um, so yeah, this, the, already you can see the stark contrast in the material materiality of that compared to the chamber pot. Um, and the, it's, uh, sorry, so unlike the long drops you've possibly encountered while bushwalking, um, little on cesspits were mere steps from the back door of these very small properties. And they were generally speaking in very close proximity to your neighbor's cesspit as well. Um, in some cases, they were even shared by multiple properties. So you didn't get your own cesspit, you had to share one with perhaps four other properties adjacent to yours. Um, so it wasn't all gloriously decorated toiletware. <laughs> the developments in the management of human waste in Melbourne are closely related to the gold rush, but perhaps not in the way that you would intuitively expect. After the rest of the world he heard about Victoria's gold, the population of Melbourne soared, as I'm sure you all know, this is, you know, <laughs> if you live in Australia, you've probably heard this a thousand times. In 1851, cesspits were simple unlined holes in the ground. In a sparsely populated settlement, this had the advantage of allowing cess to be gradually absorbed into the environment. But the rapid influx of people into Melbourne meant that the volume of offensive fluids flowing through the open drains and in the streets and seeping into cellars became an increasingly serious hazard uh, over the course of the 1850s. And um, 
actually counterintuitively, the availability of mains water from 1857 actually exacerbated the problem as people ran water continuously into their cesspits, diluting the contents and overflowing them into street channels. Diarrhea was the leading cause of death throughout the 1860s and 1870s. So, you know, this is stretching on for decades. Then there was the issue of flooding, which Melbourne is quite prone to. <laughs> they cause, this caused the contents of cesspits to overflow, not just into street channels, but into people's cellars and, you know, bottoms of base, basements of their properties. This doesn't quite fit with the usual story of grand gold rush architecture and infrastructure, does it? It was all a matter of priorities. The booming population meant that roads and railways, bridges and piers had to be built along with houses. In this context, the Yan Yin water supply system for Melbourne was not only a major engineering feat in the 1850s, but also a very expensive one. The gold rush, which produced the need for both water and sewerage, took away the manpower that might have built them. Labour costs made the Yan Yin water system so expensive that the £200,000 grant for sewerage in 1853 got spent on water supply instead. So there were intentions from even from 1853 to do something about sewerage, but yeah, <laughs> the, the water mains just cost too much. Um, this fueled a bitter and long running dispute regarding who was responsible for building Melbourne's sewerage system. The Victorian government had the legal power to do it, but not the willingness to find the money just for Melbourne. The Melbourne City Council wanted it done, but had no authority to do it for the wider metropolitan area. And the councils of the outer suburbs, where the wealth, wealthier people lived on bigger blocks, said it was the inner city's problem. They didn't want to pay extra rates to solve a problem that wasn't theirs, even though many of these people were working in the city during the day and, you know, contributing to the cesspits. The fundamental difficulty was that the gold rush was primarily about people's hip pockets and unlike private railways, toll bridges and purchase water, the cost of building sewage infrastructure produced no direct economic benefit for individuals. There was no profit to be made. Cesspit pits were foul to live with and by the 1860s they were widely accepted as being dangerous to health. Even though the reasoning here was wrong, they still thought it was the smell or miasma that was the problem. So if you, you may be thinking, what about the germ theory? Germ theory was introduced or, um, you know, uh, yeah, I guess introduced in 1861. Um, but it kind of, which definitely overlaps with the period we're talking about, but it took a long time for people to accept it and really buy into it and start making, you know, public policy decisions based on that theory. So it existed, but it wasn't in, in practical usage at that time. So for decades, all the Melbourne City Council could offer inner you know, city people living with filthy cesspits were band-aid fixes, really. The first significant government inter intervention to the problem of leaking cesspits came in the form of a circular issued by the Central Board of Health to all local boards of health, including the Melbourne City Council in 1861. It outlined recommendations for two types of leak-proof cesspits. Blue, blue stone clay lined pits for those with sufficient money and space to build them. These were pretty, pretty big. Um, and smaller buried barrel pits for those without. So basically using an old um, wine barrel and burying it in the ground and using that because a wine barrel is sealed. And for the blue stone ones, the clay lining created a sealed sort of environment. Uh, these cesspits, they cost money to both to build and to empty because no, you're no longer relying on the cess seeping into the ground, it, so these needed to be emptied. In 1860, a survey reported in the Ar Argus found that in Fitzroy, right next door to Little Lawn, a large proportion of the closets had no stone foundations, suggesting that very few of the sites in poorer neighbor neighbourhoods such as Little Lawn would have had waterproof pits before this. Yet compliance to this 1861 circular is visible in the archaeology of Little Lawn, so you know, if you look at the excavation, if you look at the photographs, if you decipher it all, you can actually see the response to this circular in the ground. And here is one example. Um, excavations at Little Long uncovered three types of lined but not watertight uh, pits, timber, brick and bluestone lined. But they found them, but they also found the more expensive sealed bluestone pits and the smaller, cheaper barrel pits, 
the latter often buried inside the old lakey cestit. So, you know, they're kind of an upgrade. <laughs> um, by the middle of the 1860s, another Band-Aid fix had been found, and this was the earth closet. Uh, so finally, we're moving above ground. <laughs> Uh, and so addressing that issue of um, cess seeping into the ground um, in a more kind of comprehensive way. And this was an above ground pan with a supply of dried, dry powdered earth to be placed over, over excrement. The downside was that the pans had to be emptied regularly and the cost was borne by individual residents. Um, once there was an above ground alternative available, the Melbourne City Council was able to demand that owners of leaking cesspits remedy the complaint, but they still couldn't demand the closure of cesspits. It was the Public Health Amendment Act of 1867 which made overflow, leakage and seepage from cesspits actually illegal and gave the Melbourne City Council the power to fine owners of leaky cesspits £20 uh, and demand their closure. The Melbourne City Council began it to issue closure no notices in 1868, uh, and this brings us to the issue of compliance. Um, in 1864, when earth closets were available, 616 notices to remedy leaking cesspits in the City of Melbourne were, were issued in six months, and 590 of them were complied with. So that's that's 97%. That's pretty good. Um, at a time when offenders could not be prosecuted for failing to comply, this suggests that most people wanted a cleaner environment. You can and, and you can kind of see where some of these cesspits are being replaced and how and the timing of it that people are actually doing this uh, off their own bat. They're not they're not necessarily always waiting for the council to force them to do it. We have evidence that some of them are opting to do it um, because it's seen as best practice and they want to invest in improving the environment that they're living in. Um, so people were choosing the best, most expensive available option. Uh, but in these instances, what's really interesting is that is done by owner occupiers. So you're talking about people who are living in the house that they own. Um, and that's something of a pattern that we see throughout this period in this area, that residential owners and those who lived locally replaced their leaky cesspits with watertight ones. Um, and they also then upgraded to the above um, ground pits without being forced to, but it was absentee landlords, so the wealthier members of the community who lived out in the suburbs, who had to be coerced into upgrading their tenant sanitary arrangements. So if they weren't living there, they weren't interested. <laughs> um, when coerced, the owners were given one week to close and fill the cesspit with clean fill, usually household items after a notice was issued. Um, and so this is where we get all those time capsules of artifacts. Um, and the artifacts in these, in it, by dating the artifacts, we can see that when these compliance, when when these notices were issued, people really were filling the cesspits within a very short period of time. So within the week that they've been issued um, the notice. And so through this process, the absentee landlords are finally being forced into taking action. Um, but for all of this progress, cesspits remained a health hazard because the 1867 legislation only introduced a municipal night pan collection service in 1870, but it cost money to close and fill the old pit pits and replace them with pans. And it seems that many landlords were reluctant to spend the money on tenants. Um, it kind of occurred to me that if you've ever rented in Melbourne, you might let out a knowing sigh here, <laughs> the difficulty of getting things done in a, in a rental property. It wasn't until a nightman and his son were asphyxiated clearing out a wealthy man's perfectly sealed concrete cesspit in 1875 that Parliament found the political will, will to legislate for the forcible closure of cesspits, not just the leaky ones, but all of them. The angry tone of the coroner's report is an indication of how long he had been agitating for action. Yet another decade went by before the government set up the Royal Commission that eventually resulted in Melbourne getting a proper sewage system in the 1890s. Uh, in the meantime, the Public Health Amendment Act of 1876 allowed the Melbourne City Council to close all the underground cesspits. But the above ground pan system was little better in terms of public health. The worst typhoid epidemics actually came in the late 1880s, pushing the Royal Commission to take action. 
but it still took the skillful machinations of Alfred Deakin to get the MMBW set up in a workable way before Melbourne finally start, started its underground sewerage station, and that's only started. Um, <laughs> the implications of the lack of sewerage for human health did at least get discussed in Melbourne's seats of power, but that wasn't the case for environmental implications. The impact of all this overflowing excrement on waterways, which Margie's going to touch on a little bit as well, um, and the environment didn't really get a look in at all. This is perhaps not surprising, given this was the booming era of the gold rush and characterised by extractivist capitalist colonial ideas. The introduction of sewers and flushing toilets solved one, one problem, that of human health, but introduced another one that we've still failed to solve 130 years later, that of clean drinking water being used to flush toilets. So just in conclusion, uh, the story of Victoria, Victoria's gold is the story of money, but it's not, it was not evenly distrib distributed and it was not necessarily used for public good. In particular, the influx of wealth did not produce much needed waste infrastructure. The history of Little on Cesspits illustrates how something as fundamental as waste disposal could be moulded by per personal financial interests and public politics. There's a link here to the fact that more people have mobile phones than access to toilets today. Railroads and water supply were quickly set up in Gold Rush, Melbourne, because they were directly related to making money. Sewers were just about poorer people not dying, so. The men in power who used cesspits while in the city for work just didn't take the problem for people who lived in the city seriously. They could go home to their comparatively spacious properties in the suburbs where housing was less dense and cesspits worked okay. Meanwhile, Melbourne's inner city residents who had to live with the stench and disease were far more inclined to do what they could to improve the situation. But for tenants, as opposed to property owners, there was very little they could do until changes were enforced from outside. That sewers weren't even started in Melbourne until the 1890s is shocking, given that this was a society that was just booming with the gold rush. And that's it from me. Sarah, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I'm struck Thank by you. the apparent disconnect between the beauty of the chamber pot as a material object and gold, no less, <laughs> and, and the consequences of poor waste management in 19th century Melbourne, as seen in the green putrid semi-liquid mass of which you spoke. Um, there's so much here about, as you say, the lived reality, especially the health and environmental consequences of waste management. Um, in particular, I'm fascinated by your archaeological discussion of material evidence and, of course, the haunting slide with which you closed. Um, it just so wonderfully captures the cruciality of this issue for human health. I'm really looking forward to discussing your findings more in further detail during our general discussion. So thank you. Thank you. Now, I'm delighted to introduce you to Margaret Anderson. Maggie is a general manager of the old Treasury Building. In a career spanning many decades, she has also held senior museum positions in Western Australia and South Australia, and in the 1980s was foundation director of the Migration Museum. Margie has a long-term interest in collections and material history. Today, Margie is talking us through class, status, and the not so humble toilet bowl. Thank you, Margie. Thank you, Sally, um, very much. And thank you, Sarah, for that great introduction to the topic. So amongst the objects found in the collection of the old treasury building is this rather singular item. I'm messing around here. A lavishly decorated toilet bowl. It was found in a corner of one of the furniture storerooms with no identifying information attached to it. Now, as you know, objects like this can drive curators mad. But in this case, we were lucky. In the 1980s, oral histories were recorded with some of the people associated with the building. And amongst those interviewed were several members of the Maynard family, here they are, who lived in the basement caretaker's flat in the decade after the First World War. Although they were only quite young children at the time, it turned out that they remembered the toilet bowl well. I'll tell you the full story later, but for now, the important thing to know is that this was the bowl of the governor's exclusive toilet. Now, as you can see, it was indeed a thing of beauty as toilets go. 
It's made of glazed earthenware with an underglaze printed pattern of red and yellow chrysanthemums. The leaves and flowers are rendered with enough botanical accuracy to make them recognisable, although we don't know whether they had any symbolic significance beyond that. Still, it was quite a lavish toilet bowl for a government building. Now, these days, of course, we tend to favour a rather less exuberant form of toilet architecture. But in the 19th and early 20th century, decorative bowls like this were very much in fashion for those who could afford them. For as with every other commodity, the fittings of one's closet, as in water closet, not cupboard, reflected one's status. One enterprising English manufacturer offered bowls in two qualities, the cottage and the castle. Our bowl, I suspect, tends towards the castle end of the spectrum. Now, as you may know, the old treasury building was commissioned in 1857 primarily to store the gold ore that was flooding into Melbourne. By then, the original treasury building in William Street, which was quite modest, had proved inadequate to the task. And every other secure bank vault in Melbourne was full to overflowing. So it was decided to build a grand new treasury adjacent to the Parliament of Victoria, but with the added function of providing administrative offices for the Chief Secretary, the Treasurer, other ministers, and most importantly, the Governor and Executive Council. And construction began in 1858. Now you might assume that a building designed to accommodate so many people and such important people at that, would include toilet facilities as a matter of course. But to our great surprise, there was no sign of any provision in the earliest plans of the building. The first plan for the ground floor where it was intended to accommodate the governor was drawn in November 1857 and made provision for something called a strong closet. At first we thought this might have been a water closet, perhaps with a strong room behind but the configuration of the rooms didn't bear out that assumption at all. It also seemed odd that a water closet should be entered from an internal corridor and not set against an outside wall for ventilation. We then looked elsewhere in the building but could find no reference to other closets, water or otherwise. At that point, we looked into the plans for the government printing office, which was constructed just behind the treasury building in 1857. This was a large structure intended for many workers. But once again, there were no toilet facilities of any kind visible on the initial plans. It's not as if the Treasury's young architect, John James Clark, was unfamiliar with water closets. They were not new in the 1850s, having been around since they were first patented in the late 18th century. We know from extant plans that Clark had included WCs in designs for two Carlton residences that he drew up earlier in 1857. More to the point, he included a quite commodious water closet in addition to the government printer's residence in the printing office in July, 1857. So we were left scratching our heads about what was envisaged for all the government workers who were busily moving into the new treasury from June 1862. What we do know is that a contract was let in July 1862 to one P. Cunningham for the quote, provision of water closets, etc., at new treasury. The sum specified in the contract was £145, quite a large sum for water closets, you might think especially as we can find reference to only two at this time. Indeed, you could build a respectable house for that in 1862. But it seems likely that the contract included modifications to the building on the ground and second floors to accommodate new water closets. The closet on the ground floor was indeed installed in the space initially described as a strong closet. While the second floor closet was probably installed at the northern end of the building, since it appears there in later plans. And some years later, a third closet was installed on this floor at the southern end. But there was nothing on the first floor or in the basement. 
Now, sadly, we've been quite unable to discover any other details of these first WCs or any correspondence to explain why they were installed retrospectively. But regardless, two WCs seems like a very small number to accommodate the number of workers in the building, even by 1860 standards. By the 1920s, the governor's loo was apparently sacrosanct, but we really have no idea if that was the case in 1862. And nor, when he finally moved into the building, was the governor actually accommodated on the ground floor as originally planned. As the age succinctly put it, owing to the altered circumstances of the colony, by which we assume the fact that the alluvial gold had dried up, leaving the treasury somewhat cash-strapped, it has been found necessary to compress the accommodation of the Treasury Department and to make room for those of the Chief Secretary and the Registrar General. The Governor and the Chief Secretary were shunted up to the first floor, leaving the Treasurer and his department occupying the ground floor. Now since, if you remember, there was no WC on the first floor, this meant that the Governor and the Chief Secretary had either to go downstairs to use the loo or traipse up the steep, narrow side staircase to the second floor. For it seems that the grand central staircase that was envisaged in J.J. Clark's 8057 plan to service all floors was another casualty of the cuts. The central staircase ends at the first floor. On the plus side, though, this also meant that their excellencies were spared the discomfort of working in close proximity to the water closets, which in 1862 were a far cry from their later equivalents. Over the years, there were many requirements in work plans to, quote, improve ventilation of the ground floor closet, which, if you remember, was completely enclosed. So how did these water closets work? As Sarah has explained, Melbourne was not deep sewered until the late 1890s and into the 20th century. In the meantime, most people in the 1860s were using privies located over cesspits, and she's told us all about those in wonderful detail. However, wealthy people might install water closets, which used water from an overhead cistern to flush away the contents of the toilet bowl. At this time, their efficiency was less than perfect. The main problem being that the water from the cistern was released with insufficient force to do its job properly, enough said. The hole then emptied eventually either into a cesspit located under the building or into a drain that ended up in a cesspit somewhere else. And since there's no sign on any plans of a cesspit being located under the old treasury building, we assume that the water closets drained into one of two cesspits in the vicinity. An 1872 plan shows a modest cesspit located near the rear entrance to Parliament House, opposite the intersection roughly of Tasma Terrace and MacArthur Street. While there was a much larger pit or, or two pits located downhill in the Treasury Gardens. These pits might also have had privies associated with them since the ordinary folk who worked in these government buildings had to go somewhere. And we hope that they weren't just nipping behind trees in the gardens. Where they went improved in 1868, when a contract was let to install a series of earth closets abutting a new perimeter wall constructed to the rear of the building. And this can be seen in a photograph taken by Charles Nettleton some time later. Now, as Sarah explained, the earth closet was the rather ingenious invention of the Reverend Henry Moole in 1860. It consisted of a wooden seat over a bucket with a box alongside containing earth or ashes. Users sprinkled a scoop of earth into the pan after use. An improved version featured a hopper above, which was filled with earth or ash. When a handle was pulled, a layer of earth was released into the bucket, which was emptied periodically by a nightman. The earth or ash, as Sarah explained, was intended to help contain odours, which those in 1860s Melbourne still thought to cause disease. And large numbers of earth closets were installed in Melbourne from the mid-1860s. Although in a characteristic failure of leadership, 
the Higginbotham government rejected advice from the chief medical officer to make earth deposits compulsory in its 1867 revision to the Health Act. So far as we can tell, the earth closets at the Treasury Building continued in use until at least 1905 and probably into the 1930s. They are shown here in a plan from 1872. But in the meantime, the cesspits in the vicinity of the Treasury Building were in a rather parlous state. And in 1872, a grand plan was conceived to drain them. The Public Works Department swung into action and designed a large drain that connected the buildings on the parliamentary and treasury reserves and linked the two cesspits in the vicinity. And where did they take the waste, do you think? Well, the obvious receptacle, sadly. The drain travelled from the large cesspit at the bottom of Treasury Gardens, ran under Spring Street, all the way along under the pavement of Flinders Street, before emptying its contents into the Yarra, just below the falls opposite Queen Street. Unfortunately, this was also right near the main steamship passenger terminus. Not so nice. The Argus was scathing in its condemnation of this arrangement, and I'll leave you to read what they had to say in 1875. But it would be another 30 years before anything was done about it. Meanwhile, at the old Treasury building, the governor was finally installed as originally intended on the ground floor in splendid new accommodation in 1884. And some years later, he was provided with a wondrous new water closet. From the mark inside the bowl, we can date the set fairly precisely to the period between 1889, when the provider, John Dankson's son, became a limited company, to 1896 when the company adopted the form Proprietary Limited. Danks and Son was by then a large company, manufacturing plumbing equipment and agricultural hardware. But it also seems to have been the Melbourne agents for a large English plumbing firm, T.W. Twyford of Hanley. Twyford's more discreet mark is impressed on the back of the bowl. Along with others, Twyford introduced several improvements to the flushing mechanism of water closets in the 1870s and 80s, and his catalogue of 1894 includes various designs for this model, the Deluge, including one that features chrysanthemums, like ours. The name of this water closet, incidentally, the Deluge, invariably amused our visitors whenever it was displayed. But in fact, the deluge in question referred not to any imagined prowess of the user, but to the efficacy of the flushing mechanism. When the chain was pulled, the deluge system released a full three gallons, which is 11.3 litres of water, in a powerful rush that promised to be, and I quote, one of the cleanest of flushes you can buy. Graham Davison has talked about the implications of using such a large volume of fresh water to flush toilets at this time, and Sarah also made that point earlier. By comparison, a modern smart toilet uses between three and four and a half litres per flush. But in the context of the poorly ventilated vice regal WC, the appeal of the cleanest flusher is perhaps understandable. Now, we don't know precisely when our deluge was installed, but it is tempting to speculate that it was acquired in advance of the anticipated arrival of a new governor, who was also a senior peer, the Right Honourable the Earl of Hopeton, in November 1889. He's shown here chairing an executive council meeting in 1890. By then, the 1862 water closet was undoubtedly showing its age and almost certainly didn't live up to the imagined expectations of an earl. Now, whether the deluge ultimately proved acceptable to His Excellency, we don't know, although an annotation to the plan that would eventually connect the Treasury building to Melbourne's deep sewer suggested that the old problems persisted. Now, you probably can't read that, but it, what it says is that there was another requirement for, quote, the ground floor WC to be efficiently ventilated. 
Now, as you may know, the government offices and Parliament House were not connected to Melbourne's sewerage system in its first years. In fact, it would be 1905 before that happened, and the waste from our political leaders finally stopped polluting the Yarra Basin. The Danube remained in place throughout this time and seems to have continued in use until about the 1970s, when this, the only photograph we have of it in situ, was probably taken. By then, it was shabby and much diminished, with its original matching system replaced by a modern push-button model and since lost. By some quirk of fate, the bowl itself was not thrown out, but stored in a back vault for posterity. And that is pretty much the end of our story. But I did promise you one final toilet tale, as told by the Maynard kids. There were eight Maynard children who lived in the caretaker's flat in the basement from 1916 to 1928. Here they are again. As you might expect, they were strictly forbidden to roam about upstairs, and that applied particularly to the governor's suite. Well, what could be more enticing to the average child? As they told it, sometimes they would pluck up the courage to creep up the dark side stairs after hours and explore the rooms above the basement. And like all small children, the lure of the governor's WC was apparently irresistible. I guess it was in stark contrast to the earth closets below stairs. So every now and again, in a childish act of class defiance, perhaps, one of the children would dare to have a surreptitious pee in the governor's loo, to their great collective delight. They still remembered the thrill of it after all those decades. My only hope is that whichever child was responsible resisted the temptation to pull the chain afterwards, because the noise of the mighty flush of the deluge was likely to echo around that empty building in the dead of night and decidedly give the game away. So there we have it. Delving into the stories behind the governor's chrysanthemum WC has revealed what is effectively a micro history of Melbourne's grubby story of human waste disposal and confirms if we ever doubted it, that class pervaded every aspect of colonial life even in the lavatory. Thank you. Maggie, that was brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, your paper serves as just the perfect call to historical inquiry through material objects and how the discovery of an object can lead to such rich insights into a particular historical moment. Again, to this theme of creating an object of such beauty for waste management, as though seeking to distance it, from, distance it from the reality of ash and dust and cesspits, or to bridge the connection between the beauty of the building and the streets beyond. Um, I'm also fascinated by your ability to trace the journey of an object, in this case, as you put it, the not so humble toilet bowl, and situate it within a longer story of a building and a city. So we'll open to questions from the audience for both Margie and Sarah in a moment, and I encourage everyone to start typing their questions into the Q&A function. But before we do, I'm interested in briefly exploring the similarities and differences in your approaches to working with objects. In this case, items that we rarely think about or dismiss or are even embarrassed by, but that tell us so much about how people lived. And could I encourage you, Sarah and Maggie, to respond to each other's paper, perhaps with a question or reflection about what struck you the most? Thanks. Mm -hmm. Well, Sarah, I don't mind going first. Um, I, I, um, Sarah and I were speaking a little bit about this um, beforehand, of course, and one of the things that, that I found so puzzling when we were trying to, to look at um, the evidence of this was what the, the privies looked like, um, because we, we can see um, that we know what some of the water closets looked like, we know in theory um, what the earth closets looked like, but what did the privies look like above ground, Sarah? Do you know from photographs? Or did anybody take pictures of them? <laughs> uh, not in this period. I think the, there's virtually, well, certainly we haven't come across any historical 
records that show the uh, what they look like above ground. You only get the plans with that little square that says cesspit. <laughs> you don't get an indication of what what then existed above ground. And also from an archaeological perspective, of course, because you're looking at uh, what what's below ground really. So in this instance, it had been a car park uh, that had existed over the old archaeological site. And so anything that, any buildings, anything that was above ground was gone by the time the archaeologists were looking at the evidence. So the evidence the archaeologists have are also, you're talking very much below ground. Um, and then as you move sort of into the turn of the century, you start getting some photographs of the area. I think the, the slide that I showed early on um, had a couple of photographs on it, but the, those, yeah, they're more from around the turn of the century. And all of the photographs are very much on the main streets. <laughs> so you don't really get the laneways or what's behind um, the buildings. So, yes, you don't, we don't really have any direct evidence either archaeological or historical of what they look like above ground uh, which is frustrating um i think there's every reason to expect based on other parts of the world and um yeah that sort of evidence that you would be talking about you know i guess your classic idea of an outhouse like it's some sort of little structure over the cesspit with um you know some setup of a toilet seat or planks aboard or some variety like that but in terms of evidence there's we haven't found any <laughs> oh thank you sarah and sarah do you have a reflection on maggie's paper oh, yeah. look i i do i i my question is possibly a bit of a funny cheeky one <laughs> but I, I I certainly have looked into a little bit about the fact that people were what people were wiping with and you know, ripped up newspaper leaves old rags things like that and so I was wondering whether you have come across any information about whether the governor had anything better than newspaper um or not <laughs> It's interesting because one of the questions that's come through to to both of us is uh, what was used as toilet paper throughout oh. the century. <laughs> and, of course, you know, I can't answer the throughout the centuries too well, although I've read a little bit about it. All sorts of things is the answer, depending on where you were. But um, there was in the 19th century um, something that was marketed um, as uh, medicated paper which was what we would now call toilet paper, but it certainly wasn't sold in grocer shops or anything like that. In fact, it was sold as a sort of a, um, um, not quite medicine, but by pharmacists. And it was very expensive. And so ordinary folk, um, I mean, the, the um, folk knowledge is that people cut up newspapers. Um, and in fact, we know that that happened. And I can tell you a tiny, funny little story about that in a minute. But the, the quick answer is we don't know. We haven't been able to find any note about whether toilet paper was supplied to the governor or indeed um, whether there was a contract to supply um, this medicated paper to government house, which would be the other, um, or parliament house, would be the other indicator. But we haven't given up. We're going to keep on searching and see if we can find it because somehow I can't really imagine that the chrysanthemum loo went with um, cut up newspaper, but maybe that's just me making an assumption. Mm. But can I tell the very quick story? It came from one of our um, people who works at um, the Treasury Building, Hannah Viney, and it was told by her grandmother who, who grew up in Dandenong. Um, she was a teenager there in the 1950s, still had a long drop toilet out the back, and it was her job to cut up the newspaper squares. And she said they cut up newspapers, the phone book, remember the phone books? That that went out the back as well, store catalogues. But the Women's Weekly was sacrosanct. She was not allowed to cut up the Women's Weekly. And I thought that was a lovely story. Oh, that, that is, I love that. that. And actually, that thank you both. And that leads into, we're getting some wonderful questions coming through in the Q&A. So I'll just post some of these. But your story, Maggie, feeds into some of this, the theme of gender and the differences here. So one of the questions that I have, um, first, thank you both for fascinating and fun papers. And it is asked, would either of you like to reflect on the gendering of toilets, private and public, in both a functional and cultural sense? And so we noticed that row of urinals in the OTB. Do you want to start, Sarah? 
Uh, Margie can probably address the urinals and the and the specifics for the OT, OTV and we have been chatting a bit about parliament and, you know, expectations of women and how many women were in there. But I'll leave that part to Margie and um, I'll, I'll talk a bit about, I, I do know that in Melbourne in the, you know, shopping after the gold rush was becoming a big thing. Um, and, you know, I, I've done lots of research into consumerism and what people were buying and how they were buying it. And um, shopping became like this sort of display and this process and this kind of uh, arena for women to really have uh, agency and control in their lives to some degree. But there were no toilets for them to go to when they were shopping. Um, so, I, I, and I, I believe, oh gosh, I can't quite remember where, but I almost believe I remember reading something about, uh, you know, women having to get home. <laughs> not shop for too long because they needed to get home um but yeah there, there certainly weren't uh any toilets for women in the gold rush period in this in the shopping districts in the middle of melbourne uh, and i think margie maybe you want to share that bit about um the the dates of when because that's oh, yes <laughs> there, there, there was a, a public toilet for men was built um, outside the post office in Burke Street in 1859. But the first public toilet for women was not built until 1902, which is staggering, isn't it? Mm. But by then, of course, the new department stores, that was one of the big attractions of um, the big department stores when they started to open, that they had toilets in them. And so the women especially, that, that was seen as a big draw card to the department stores because the women could go there. Mm. And before but, you know, some of the anecdotal evidence, which I think came from um, a rather remarkable, I forget her name, um, a an historian in Dunedin in New Zealand who wrote about women, um, public toilets. And and she said that, that at a time when, you know, women's underwear was not sealed at this time, so women's drawers were open, that it was not uncommon for women to just stop over a, a gutter and just urinate if they had to um because their skirts hid what was happening um but it's not a pleasant thought really quite apart from, from anything else is it um but it's a in terms of the gendering of toilets it's i think we know very little um about the private gendering of toilets apart from the fact that i think that um the chamber pots that you talk about sarah there were also um chairs weren't there that that were available with chamber pots in them and they were seen as being a, a kind of a middle class um um answer to some sort of privacy but as far as we can tell the earth closets and things that were built apart from the row of urinals um as deb has pointed out in her question obviously they were for men as far as we can see the earth closets were just um, used by everybody and we don't know when women were first employed in the treasury building but I do know that there were women employed in the printing office in from the 1850s and 60s they were they were sewing the books together and doing other jobs like that um and so presumably they were using whatever was available, mm -hmm. earth, whether they were um, the earth closets or before that, the privies. Thank you. I mean, this is, I feel like this is one of those occasions where the two papers have just worked together so beautifully. And I think that is probably partly why we have generated more questions than we have time to answer. And I am sorry that that is the case because I'd love to be able to continue going through some of these discussions, particularly when we're getting to women and gender, I guess, my interest. So um, what we can do, though, is we can collect those questions and answer those. So we can certainly do that. But I'm aware that we're running out of time. So to close, I just I'd like to really thank Sarah and Margie for your terrific papers. I've enjoyed them so much. And this seminar series has just covered so much in the realm of material histories. And we know that material things encompass the mundane and the utilitarian. And what could be more mundane and utilitarian than the toilet bowl and waste management? However, not so. You've given us wonderful examples of why these objects can tell us so much about life in early Melbourne, class, status, health, environmental concerns, and gender all issues which rightly continue to capture our attention today.
So I'd also like to thank the team behind the Material History Seminar Series at the Old Treasury Building and the Australian Catholic University. Our next seminar in the series is on two material histories of the Second World War to be held on Friday, the 10th of November, 2023. We'd love it if you could join us. So please let me thank you for your attendance, interest and participation. We've greatly enjoyed having you with us. Please have a look at the Material Histories page on the Old Treasury Building website for future seminars or if you have an idea for a future seminar. So thank you again, everyone, and enjoy your afternoon.